I pray that um, our desire for the Lord, our zeal for the Lord will increase, and as the zeal increases, our knowledge too will abound in Jesus' name. All right, um, it's time for Sunday school, and today... Lesson 30, lesson 30, lesson 30. Before we start, let us pray. Marvelous God, we thank you for your generosity, your light that abounds in our midst this morning. We ask that the good work you have started, you will continue in the name of Jesus. That our hearts will be open to receive your word with meekness. And you will give us a word and season. You will cause the eyes of our understanding to be enlightened. And you will fill us with the knowledge of your will. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. All right. The teaching is... Sorry, lesson 30. Lesson 30. Lesson 30. The title of the... Okay, sorry, I'll revert. All right, the title of the message is um, Opposite Sex Friendship. Opposite Sex Friendship. Say with me, Opposite Sex Friendship. It's amazing that um, this particular topic addresses a lot of youths, but our youths are not in church. But I'm trusting God that some are watching online or they will get to watch this later in Jesus' name. Um, our memory verse is from Romans 13, verse 14. And I want us to master it, Romans 13, 14. Please, can, can I have it on the screen? Romans 13, 14, the New King James Version. Romans 13, 14. And we're going to read it together. One, two, three, go. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill it. Again, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its loss. For the last time, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its loss. Please, can you take it away and let us do it without uh, the screen? One, two, three, go. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust again. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. One more time. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Don't forget, I will still ask us before the end of this teaching. Glory to God. So we are examining opposite sex friendship. Actually, there are four different relationship status or statuses. <laughs> four different relationship status. The first is single. <laughs> the second one is, you know, okay, let me say five, in a relationship or engaged. Then the third one is married. The fourth one is divorced. Then the last one is complicated. <laughs> you know, there are people you ask, if they are not single, they are not married, they are not divorced, they will tell you it's complicated. So to avoid that complicated relationship status, that's why we are having a topic like this. So that when they ask you, when they ask us, you know, where do you belong? Oh, I'm single. Oh, I'm married. Oh, I've been divorced. Oh, you know, I'm in a relationship. Oh, I'm engaged. The only one that you should not be in is the complicated one. And that's why we're examining a topic like this. Let us see Romans chapter 12 from verse 9 to 10. Romans chapter 12 from verse 9 to 10. Romans chapter 12, our lesson text. It says, let love be without hypocrisy. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Abhor what is evil. He now says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. There is such a thing called brotherly love amongst the brethren. 
you know, last year when I was privileged to share on the subject love, I told us the different kinds of love that exist. We have the erotic love that exists between a man and a woman in a relationship. We have the brotherly love, the affectionate love that ought to exist among brethren. It's like, in fact, if you check the original Greek translation, it's like you've been in a court. You know, have you seen court people? They, they, they look out for one another, always there for one another, always there to defend their brother. Like, a, a, an attack on one is an attack on all. That's how God expects us to be in the Christendom. And that's why gossiping, division, strife, envy should not thrive in our midst if there is brotherly love. I should be looking out for you, even in your absence. If someone is trying to, you know, malalign your name or say something negative about you, even if you're not there, it is my responsibility as part of the member of the body of Christ to defend your identity, to uphold your integrity. Even if what they are saying is true, it is my responsibility to defend you. You know, um, so that brotherly love ought to exist among brethren. But the greatest form of love, there is the, um, there's another one that exists between mothers and their children, or parents and their children. Um, some call it stoige, some call it storge. You know, the kind of love a, a, a parent has for a child is not the same you have for your spouse. The way you love your husband is not the same way you love your child. So that kind of love is, it's another kind of love. But the greatest kind of love is Agape, that is the unconditional love of God. There will be times that brotherly love will fail. You know, we are often betrayed by people that, you know, we tend to love the most. Betrayal comes from people that we love the most. Offense often comes from people we love the most. And that's why when brotherly love fails, when erotic love fails, agape must never fail. And that's the love that should abound in our heart. Bible says that the love of God, that is the agape love of God, has been shared abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. But here, the Bible is talking about being kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. That means when we are in the faith, we are together, you have siblings that are, you know, of the opposite sex, your motive towards them should be pure. When Paul was addressing Timothy and Titus, especially Timothy, you know, a young pastor over the church at Ephesus, he was telling him, address older women as mothers. He says, entreat older men as fathers. Even if you're anointed, you are over people, there's a way to relate with people in your congregation. He says, address older, entreat younger men as brothers. He now says, entreat younger women as sisters with utmost purity. Utmost, I mean, it was very specific in your relationship with the opposite sex, in the, in the, in the, in the believer's fold. It has to be with the utmost purity because in this age and in this time, people misinterpret a lot of things. And there are a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of young women that sometimes reach out, they've been abused, they've, you know, um, by people they call leaders. And, you know, sometimes we assume because we, we have a church mind that everyone is like us. You know, we are in the church, and church is like a hospital. Everyone is responding to treatment, but not at the same level. We are not all at the same level of faith. We may look, you know, all calm, cool, and collected. You don't know what is going on in someone else's heart. There are people that I, I remember the story of a particular um, lady that I heard about in church. So there was this guy in court. <laughs> And then they, they made a bet in the courtes and with his friend. They made, a, they made a belt. The guy was an unbeliever, actually. They made a belt with his friend. And this girl, you know, I've been trying to, you know, there's a girl, a very a church girl. I have been trying to get her attention, but let's make a bet. Give, give, them, give themselves a, a, a time frame that I'm going to ask her. She's going to say yes to me and all. And guess what the guy did? An unbeliever, she jo he joined the church. It started, it became consistent. He started serving, you know, he asked the lady out and his goal was to sleep with the lady. And he ended up, and when the thing was done, went to his friend and said, I succeeded, where is my money? And that was it. So sometimes we can come together, think, oh, we are calm, cool, and collect, collected. Someone is consistent. You don't know the level of relationship they have with God. And that's why, you know, um, Paul had to tell Timothy, when you are in your relationship with older women, and treat them as mothers. How would you treat your own biological mother? He says, younger women as sisters, would you sleep with your own sister? 
Would you? He said no. And treat them as your own sisters with all purity. That means in your relationship with opposite sex, your motive must be pure. And that's why we are bringing a topic like this because in Christian, you know, um, the lesson introduction says Christian youths come together for diverse reasons such as academic activities. <laughs> This, this reminds me of a particular friend of mine. We were, when I was in college, 200, from 200 level to 500 level, a guy, we actually read, prepare, I was just with my husband the other day, like throughout my, um, sec, my 200 level to 500, when we were in med school, we read together, like we had the same spot. His table was here, my table was there, was in front of a lab in um, College of Health Sciences. And for five good years, for almost four years, we were, people knew that we were very close. I remember there was a day I had missed, uh, had missed like, um, what's it called? What do you used to call it? Like what you call continuous assessment. And it was like 30 marks. I didn't know I was in my hostel. <laughs> like, don't let me tell you what I was doing. I was in my hostel. I just got a call, follow job, follow job, follow job. We are having an in-course. We are having an in-course. I rushed. I had no brushed. I had no baited. You know, you, you need people like that. And you know the funny thing? We read together. It was always with pure motive. It, I, I knew about his relationship. He knew about my relationship. He never had an ulterior motive. We even went to do internship in the same place. Place. And then, but it's just that the uh, friendship fell apart the day he asked me out. <laughs> the friendship fell apart. You know why I, I said that to say this? Sometimes, sometimes, let me say this, sometimes, most people that um, you ever, you'll be in a relationship with, that God will make you like, where your spouse will most likely be around your circle of engagement. It could be in school, it could be at work, it could be in church. You don't know where God can, I mean, like, that's how you meet people. You know, ask people that have, you know, probably dated or been in a relationship, they will tell you, oh, I, had, I met my spouse in um, the church fellowship. I met my, um, my spouse, you know, we had a, 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 a meeting at work, a conference on campus. Like, you, most likely, your God might position who you marry around you in one way or another. It's not always the case. There are exceptions. Let me say that. There are ex exceptions. You can meet your spouse in the most random ways. But then, uh, even though you can, and as singles, I, I, I really want us to be very practical with a topic like this, because the people of the world believe that for you to have opposite sex friendship, it means that there is actually an affection that is not mutual. If you say someone is my friend, and in the un unbeliever setting, they believe that actually one or both of you has an affection towards the other person. The reason you are agreeing to be friends is because the affection is not mutual. But for you to say, oh, I want to be friends with you, there is a level, even if it is platonic, there is a level of affection. You may not be the one having affection for the other person, but the other person might have it for you. But because the, that affection is not mutual, that's why you agree to be friends. But in, Christ, in um, the believer setting, it's a different thing. That I can, I can be friends with the opposite sex without necessarily having affection, like a, a wrong affection or a wrong motive. That is what is called brotherly love. That I can see someone and say, this is my brother. That's where the word brethren came out of. Glory to God. So this is Christian youths come together for diverse reasons, such as academic activities, business or social engagements, spiritual exercises, and so on. I'm sure you have heard the saying that, marry your friend, marry your friend, marry your friend. But this is a truth. Another sincere truth is that you should make whoever you marry your friend. So if you're in a relationship with someone, but your best friend is someone of the opposite sex. It's already a threat to your relationship. If you're married to someone and your best friend, your bestie, is someone of the opposite sex, it's already a threat to your marriage. Because you're, like that memory verse says, says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and give no occasion for the flesh. If the devil wants to find a way into your relationship or your marriage, he will use that because if you are not making your spouse or the person you're in a relationship with, you're confident, and it's someone else, every time you need emotional succor, you will look, you will look for that person that is of the opposite sex and not your partner and that can be a threat or an attack on your relationship or your marriage glory to god so marry your friend but also make whoever you marry your friend your your your, your confidant the person you open up to the first person you call when you want to share something with glory to god in fact research has shown that 53.5 percent 
of people that engage in, you know, um, marital, extramarital affairs, always have it with people of the opposite sex that they, they had a, an existing relationship with. Now, when I mean existing relationship, maybe someone of the opposite sex that you have been friends with, that 53.5% of extramarital, proven by research, by statistics, that 53.5% of extramarital affairs often happen with people that you have, you have like that emotional entanglement with. And that's why your spouse must become your best friend. Your spouse must become your greatest confidant. Glory to God. So... When we begin to meet people of opposite sex, whether through school, whether through work, through business, spiritual exercises, it is important that um, you know, we define the boundaries and you know, make some necessary adjustment. So it says, in the process, making friends with the opposite sex may be inevitable. One thing about brotherly love is this. Um, you owe everybody agape, but you don't owe everybody I can, love, I, can, I can love you, but I don't have to like you. So for you to be friends with someone, you're indirectly saying, I like you. I have a special interest in sharing my life with you. Now, I can love everybody with the love of God, agape, but I'm not commanded to like everybody. I'm not commanded to give you the privilege to open up my life to you. If I like you, I'm giving you privilege, you know, to get to know about me and I get to know about you. Glory to God. We can give ourselves emotional support in seasons when we need it. You should have that friend in your life that, you know, when your head is hot and you feel you are right, someone that can bring, you know, there are some friends that they will always support you even in your weaknesses. Like, let, let me say it this way. Let's say you are wrong. You did something wrong. But you're trying to insist on your own rights. You're trying to defend yourself. There are some friends you should have in your life that can call you to order. Even if, when you think you are right, and they know that you are wrong, they can say, mm -mm, I'm your friend. I owe it to you to tell you the truth. People that can call, they will not, they will not side with you in your, in your, I mean, like, I don't know if you get what I'm saying. People, people that will not just, they, will, they won't just side with your dysfunction. They will call you to order, yeah. Like, yes, I am your friend, but I owe you to tell you the truth. So you, everyone needs such relationship in their lives. Glory to God. And one of the best places you can find that is in the church amongst the brethren. Glory to God. So it's a making friends with the opposite sex is inevitable, but it is not a sin as long as the motive is pure. It is not a sin as long as the motive is pure. Friendship with no string attached. There are people that once you start getting close to them, you know, I used to say something, proximity breeds affection. Proximity breeds affection. You, <laughs> you, you are friends with someone of the opposite sex, and every day you, you exchange text. You're talking, you're existing. You are doing everything. After every conversation, you say, good night, dear. All those things, are, <laughs> you are dropping five love emojis. The person is not your partner. The person, automatically, it can breed affection. And that's why your motive must be pure from the onset. See, even if you're going to be in a relationship with someone you call friend, at least give room for friendship. Build proper friendship first. Because if you set up, because there are, pe there are people that set out to be your friend with the intention of getting married to you, and there's nothing wrong about that. What happens in that kind of case is that you, you can begin to put on a mask because you're trying to put your best foot forward because you have a goal in mind. There is an end in view. So everything you are doing is to the end that a relationship will happen. So that, that's what I'm saying. That even if you want to be friends with someone of the opposite sex, let your motive be pure. I want to get to know this person. I just want to develop a platonic, a platonic, not no string attached. Because in this time and in this generation, a lot of things are happening. And I don't want us to just have a church mind like everyone is like us. Not everybody is like us. It says, however, it becomes an issue of concern when we co consider the common mistakes foreseeable, we shall attempt to unravel some of the mistakes as well as discuss some of the tips for pure friendship with the opposite sex. So friendship with the opposite sex is not wrong if you, um, you're kindly affectionate towards one another like, like Apostle Paul said. <laughs> 
like, sorry, when I laugh like that, some things pass through my mind. I'm like, should I share? Should I not share? You know, someone might misinterpret this. And you know, I was remembering when Paul would say, you know, when he's closing his letter, give the brothers um, uh, a kindly and affectionate kiss. A, a kiss. And then some people said that's the scripture for, you know, kissing, like romantic kiss. Paul said, kiss one another. <laughs> so it's funny how people interpret the scripture and make it say what they want to say. Back then in the culture, if you, even if you go to a Frenchman's land, the way they greet themselves, you know, they, they hug and then, um, it, like side pecks, like, but then someone say, ah, kiss one another, romantic kiss. You know, yes, we are friends, we are brothers, we are brethren, but Bible says we can kiss one another. There are a lot of unforeseeable mistakes. Uh, all these things is out new. <laughs> Let's not use our church fight like everyone is like us. <laughs> okay, the common mistakes that are often make in opposite sex friendship number one, ignoring proper boundaries but before i do before i go into that number my own number one in my notes is keep the motive pure keep the motive pure you know sometimes women can be they can go overboard when you meet someone of the opposite sex, especially if you're a single lady you are thinking what's the son name is it the messiah we have been expecting or another we should expect another does his name go with my name how tall is he is his surname tush you're already thinking like one million things when you meet someone of the opposite sex for the first time i want you to tell i want to tell you calm down <laughs> calm down it's not every person every opposite sex that you meet that is a potential spouse calm down keep the motive pure even if a relationship is going to blossom from there let the friendship be platinum because the moment you start having oh is it the meza we have been expecting or we should expect another you will start you know um trying to put your best foot forward and you start living an hypocritical life you're trying to be who you are not because you're trying to gain the person's attention even if the person has a very pure motive so calm down, look to your neighbor, say calm down. <laughs> because once the motive is not pure, you will start having unrealistic expectations from the friendship. And this will set you up for disappointment. Oh, ah, he has not called me today. Is, is your friend not your boyfriend? Ah, he did not compliment how I look today. Is your friend not your boyfriend? Oh, he didn't see the hair I just made. Is your friend not your boyfriend? Glory to God. So number two, set proper boundaries. Next week, I'm going to you know, um, talk about this a lot, um, how to set proper boundaries. It is important that you define it. <laughs> it is important that you set proper boundaries. So I remember I, I, ha I once had a friend, an opposite sex, someone of the opposite sex. Uh, I would say that you know, well, you, there was intention from his end for a relationship to blossom. So, you know, the friendship was supposed to grow into something that it eventually did not grow into. But then when we were friends, I remember it was a day I was having, we were having a conversation and he has another friend of the opposite sex. The only challenge is that the friend of the opposite sex he has was a pastor's wife. And every time the woman was having a challenge in her marriage, he would tell this, my friend, this is what, you know, her husband has been doing to her. And then this, mutual friend that we both have would tell me and you know the funny thing i know the pastor i know the pastor's wife but they i'm not sure they knew me and this was me a random stranger knowing what was going on in their marriage in their sexual life and i said to myself if this friend can communicate can tell me what is going on in someone else's marriage whatever is going on in my own life too we, we is able to communicate with someone that's that was one of the asking for me to break such friendship that this is not safe for me whoever can tell you about someone else's life can also tell some, someone else is like about you. Yeah, someone else about you. So there, there's a way you can discern people correctly. Like I knew what was going on in the um, man's marriage. I knew what was going on in that. And because we had a mutual friend. And that's why I said your spouse must be your greatest confidant. Your spouse must be your best friend. There are some information that should not leave your marriage. There are some information that should not leave your relationship. It's not like every time you're having a child and I say, this one is my bestie, but this one is my husband. This one is my bestie. Yeah, you can't. I'm not saying that being in a relationship or getting married should mean you should cut off all your friends. No, you are not supposed to cut off your friends, but you are supposed to, you know, define boundaries. There are boundaries you don't. When I got married, I intentionally told myself there, are, like, it can, there are some there are some conversations that cannot go beyond hello. There are some conversations that can, there's, there was someone that was trying to you know get mad at me. I, I'm just trying. I, I, I'm sorry, I cannot help you. Go meet a male pastor. 
There are some people you cannot help. Don't say because you're anointed, you want to, you know, mentor this, mentor that. There are some people you will never be able to help because you're trying to define a clear boundary. You don't want the devil. Bible says don't give an occasion for the flesh. You know, sometimes when believers fall into sexual sin, it's not because they want to, it's because they are naive. Most believers that fall into sexual sin, when you hear oh, pastor, a pastor fell into a sexual scandal, sometimes they were not thinking or planning it. They were just too naive. They just felt everybody was as innocent as them. They didn't know that there are people that come with ulterior motive. They say, oh, I want counseling. But what they want is more than counseling. So that naivety, that innocence, and it's one of the things that make ministers of God to be well scammed because of their, the largeness of their heart makes them want to be generous to a lot of people and people take advantage of that generosity. So, and that's why you must define clear boundaries. There are boundaries you will never go with the opposite sex. There are places we don't go. You know, you call someone your friend, you, you know, you, um, someone of the opposite sex, you're already following you and the family, they already say, our wife, our wife. I say, we are not wife. You, I'm not, we are not in a relationship <laughs> You are not in a relationship. How many people do you, want to, do you want to tell that? Define it. And there are some people, they are in assumed relationship. Because you've been friends with someone. And let me say this, men, you need to, uh, we need to be very careful. Women are more emotional beings. Why men are more logical? Women are very emotional. I know that we are believers. We are spirit, soul, and body. But the way God wired a woman. A woman is more, a woman interprets things first emotionally before she starts interpreting it logically. A man interprets a situation logically before he starts interpreting it emotionally. And that's why, let me not go into some details, this is church. So, um, <laughs> so when, a, when you are in an opposite sex friendship and you start doing some things, you start saying some things, you start, a woman begins to, you know, you are triggering her emotions and arousing things that uh, you are not supposed to arouse. And this is why it is important as a woman that you also protect yourself. Protect yourself, protect your heart. I remember when I was single, and one of, a leader in church, he used to post my picture on his WhatsApp status. And I was not the only one who used to do it. Like there are some other ladies in church who just post, oh, firebrand, all those things. And he used to do it a lot, so much that there were people that wanted to ask me out. They just assumed, because this person used to post my picture that we are probably dating, or this is probably who he's going to marry. One day, it was until he got married, some people had the boldness to start asking me out. And I went to tell him, please, please, release my destiny <laughs> from your WhatsApp status. Stop, they just, they just form a covering over your life. And everyone that should be a potential spot, they assume that you're in a relationship. Don't, don't use me on your WhatsApp. Because <laughs> some, some men got scared. They actually told me. I said, we thought you were dating this person. We thought this was the person you were going to marry. Because people were seeing those, they see me on the status. Ah, this one is taking me. I'm not taking, no, please. <laughs> and you know the point, the person was not even putting his own spouse on the WhatsApp status. All of us are now single, they're waiting on God. <laughs> they were covering our destinies on WhatsApp page. Please, uh, can we talk about the use of emojis and sensitive words. You call someone a photo person say, yes, you, you may have, you may not have any ulterior motive, but as soon as you start using the word, hello dear, a woman's emotion begins to come out. Women, am I saying the truth? The other generation may not understand what we are saying, but we know. <laughs> the millennials and the Gen Zs, you, 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 you're already saying hi there. You finish your conversation. You, you, you know that emoji with kiss, kisses? Yeah, you say, ah, that means I love you. You may not even know. You are just in your church mind. The guy is just trying to be, you know, relational and then sends love emojis. Every conversation ends with a, a sending you hugs, hugs and kisses. I'm like, ah, is it French kiss? Is it biblical kiss? Is it romantic kiss? You are thinking 1,000 things in your mind. Please. When you are in a relationship with the opposite sex, uh, friendship, misin don't misinterpret the attention of the opposite sex. Don't. Don't. Say with me, don't. Don't misinterpret. Actually, my time is gone. Don't misinterpret the action of the opposite sex. And don't ignore boundaries. Don't ignore boundaries. Another thing you should, mistakes that people make when they're in an opposite sex friendship is that they give a blind eye to danger signals such as emotional attraction, attempt to touch sensitive parts of the body, 
holding hands, cuddling, pecking. Let me, let, me, let me say this to women because of how God wired us. Once you notice that, okay, you are in a relationship, you are friends with someone of the opposite sex, and you notice that affection starts breeding, one of the things you can do to help or protect your heart is to stop communication. Define it. Please, I, 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 please can, can we stop having conversations for now? So, because proximity, like I said, it breeds affection. You keep co communicating with someone every day. Automatically, your mind starts going in that direction. Oh, maybe he has something for me, but he's, he doesn't know how to discern it. And in your mind, you're already in an assumed relationship. And the guy now posts on his status that I'm getting married. You are like, ah, he broke my heart. How did he break your heart? You know, there are people that are following um, <laughs> stars on, on social media. Oh, like a guy got engaged, Moses Bliss. <laughs> a lot of online, online fans feel that their hearts have been broken. Why? Because, <laughs> because someone is popular. They are now saying, ah, why did you break my heart like this? Does he even know you? <laughs> people, sometimes people be in assumed relationship because, oh, he, 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 he used to call me once every week. I thought that he liked me. How? See, if someone does not clearly spell out that I want to be in a relationship with you, please don't assume it. Don't assume it. Don't say, eh, you know, are you single? Not really. Are you married? Not really. Are you in a relationship? It's complicated. To avoid that kind of status, once you see that af your affection is start starts to grow towards someone, cut off communication. Because well, there are many things it can expose you to before you know it, even though you're not in a relationship, because you are breed, you have, the affection are, has grown over time. If you find yourself in tight spots, you will you will find yourself, you know, engaging in sexual lust. And you're not in a relationship, you just realize that you have slept with someone you call friend. You needed emotional support, the person was there for you. Before you know it, you have touched, you have kissed, you have done all those things. Ah, we're just friends, it was just calming me down. No, I just went through an heartbreak, there was nobody I could talk to. You reach out to the person of the opposite sex. And both of you, because you were both naive, and you were vulnerable at that point, you end up, and that's what Bible says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. When, when, <clears throat> when Christ is at the center of what we do, whether it's relationship, whether it's marriage, whether it's friendship, he says make no provision. That, that means it is possible to make provision for the flesh. When the boundaries are not clearly defined, you are making provisions for the flesh. They are so, sexual loss, the Bible says flee, all appearances of evil. Sometimes you are not thinking about it, but you have made provision for it. You are making provision through the communication. You are making, you dress well, you send a picture of how you look to the guy, and you are expecting that affection will not, will not grow. Uh, we, are just, we are just friends now. Men are moved by what they see. Define boundaries, there are things you cannot share. There are things you cannot say. There are emojis you cannot use. There, there are things, you not put the person's, picture on status, you know, write some, other people will misinterpret what you are saying, say, ah, I thought you guys were dating, we are not dating, no. That's how a lady, I remember a lady, where I served, um, she's a, she was a, a worship minister in church, there was another guy in media that was, um, yeah, they were, so el everybody in church thought they were in a relationship because they were opposite sex friends, I mean, this is the believer's fold, friendship showed, blows on me in our midst, but it must be brotherly love. And that's how I had left the place. I just saw online that the guy proposed to the girl, and he, you know, people were posting you, congratulations, this, congratulations, that. So I reached out to the girl, so I was like, ah, congratulations. I said, actually, oh, we, I, I said, no, ah. I said, what happened? He said, actually, people thought we were in a relationship, but we're actually friends. That there was really never a time where he asked me out. He said, we got so close that we just assumed the relationship. And then the guy went to propose, and the girl turned. Uh, both of them now, they are not yet married. It's been several years. I don't know whether they will still eventually marry themselves or they will. But then, you can be in an assumed relationship with someone because you are so close. Everybody thought, ah, this, this girl is taking, that guy is taking, this girl is taking. And because of every other person's assumption, too, I guess the guy, too, went along with it, went ahead to do a, a, a wedding proposal. And the lady said, Pastor she actually there was really never a time where we sat down and said we wanted to date each other. We were just good friends. We became close and then uh, as in relationship. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending us your word. I pray in the name of Jesus.
for the grace to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and not make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Thank you.